Hey, well, welcome. Welcome. Um, in my case, the good morning. Uh, in other cases, uh, good evening, good afternoon. So it's a lot of fun being here. It'd be more fun if we were together in person. It didn't work out that way, but uh, here we go. Let's make the best of it. So I decided to talk about the warm ISM, the warm ionized ISM. And uh, that's uh, kind of been a, a long-standing interest of mine. And then if you think about what are you, what are you after? If you're studying the warm ISM, what do you really care about? So I'm not going to get into codes and really detailed atomic physics. It's kind of boring. I'm going to talk about the big picture of the astronomy we want to get. So perhaps the most fundamental thing we get out of this is where we came from, the elements were, uh, were made of. So this is a fantastic uh, image that Jennifer Johnson up at Ohio State did showing the origin of the chemical elements, the things that, uh, where we come from, the various uh, sites uh, that have made the atoms inside of our, uh, inside of our bodies. So this is in some ways is the most basic question we can we can ask is where did the, the where did the atoms to build up planets come from and then from there you go and how did how did the complex chemistry that happened in the ISM and the, as the formation of the Earth happened how did that lead to life so one of the first questions then is how do you measure this how do we know where these elements came from but Emission lines from interstellar matter, you, that's one of the main ways we do this, is from H2 regions are a case where you can measure these elements in star forming regions. Uh, the opposite end of the life of a star, you can measure these abundances in planetary nebulae and supernova remnants. In that case, nuclear processes inside the star have produced additional elements. You want to measure that because that's a test of whether we understand how, how stars work. So, and then on the bigger picture, um, we have a disadvantage in astronomy. We can't do an experiment. We have a big advantage. We have a time machine. So we can get spectra at higher and higher redshift and go to, to redshift five, even 10. So we can look back in time and you need to look at very luminous things when you're looking very far away. But again, you can see emission lines coming from these objects and, and hope to measure these things as they uh, uh, as they were five or 10 billion years ago. So this is an important test of whether we understand how the cosmos evolved. The second bigger thing is, this is a, the, Wiki, the Wikipedia image of the interstellar medium is the Wisconsin H alpha mapper wham. Uh, so this is a picture of the, of the Milky Way galaxy from the Earth that's taken with the H alpha optical emission line. And so this is, I'm sure you've seen far more spectacular molecular 21 centimeter images than the Milky Way would understand as the basic structure. So to, uh, to do that, what you want to think about both these things, but you want to think about what's called the cooling function. And so the cooling function is probably the most basic thing about interstellar matter. Uh, so it's the rate that gas thermal energy is converted into light that escapes. So it's the rate that, that gas cools off. So if you think about your high school physics, heat is transferred by radiation conduction and convection. And so if you think about a piece of the ISM out there in space, uh, it can it has a certain amount of heat. Uh, the heat is proportional to the, uh, the temperature of the gas. And we're trying to figure out what kind of energy sources are needed to maintain that and how fast is that going to lose its, uh, uh, lose its heat. And so if your interstellar cloud is not it can't lose by conduction because it's not, it's not attached to a heat sink or heat can flow. Convection may or may not occur, but that's not going to result in heat loss from the cloud. The way that cloud loses heat out to the universe is by, radi by radiation, by emitting light. 
And then the detailed atomic physics of that is thermal processes so that the atoms and the gas are moving around at different speeds and if they can collide or interact in various ways they can convert their kinetic energy into light and the light escapes so that cools so any process that converts kinetic energy energy of motion into energy of radiation is a cooling process a heating process is anything that converts light into kinetic energy so uh, where this the cooling function is the answer to the question how, how fast does this cloud convert kinetic energy into into um, into light so a cooling function looks like this and something it, it the, the cooling function is a property of detail what, what's called microphysics so microphysics is an all-encompassing term for atomic physics, plasma physics, and molecular physics and chemistry. So, and physical, physical chemistry. So it includes, for instance, the atomic processes that describe where electron orbits are in an atom and how the electrons move up and down. It uh, describes association to association processes with molecules and grain surface chemistry on, on, uh, on grains. So microphysics is a big, uh, a big part of, of astronomy. We have to worry about this a lot. And so you see this curve. So I'm going to be talking about, for the first third, qu uh, quarter or third of the talk. I'll be talking about the cooling function. So this is the temperature across the bottom, and uh, this is a range of, of relevant temperatures from maybe 100 Kelvin up to 10 to the 8 Kelvin. And this shows the, the rate at which uh, the gas co cools off. So the units are ergs per cubic centimeter per second. So this is the rate at which one cubic centimeter of, of matter would, would cool off. So you see this sort of like a, 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 you know, the Alps or the roller coaster or something goes up and goes down. And because it goes up and goes down, thermal, uh, the ISM, has certain properties it has a certain structure and the reason it goes up and down goes and boils down into the, the microphysics which i want to talk to you very about very quickly and it uh, uh, is, is a fundamental property of, of matter okay so what i'm going to do <clears throat> is work my way from the top the highest temperatures down to the lowest temperatures so if you go up here you see the cooling function, this is a very high temperature. So that means the particles in this gas have temperatures of you know, 110 to 10 million Kelvin up to 100 million Kelvin. So this means a typical energy, if you think about kinetic energy of the particles is kilovolts. These are very high energy particles. Uh, the, the, the gas, gas at this temperature the average electron or, or hydrogen in that gas has a kinetic energy of kilovolts, it's very high energy. And so that means that when they collide, the collisions are extraordinarily violent and can tear away the electrons at, at that temperature. So what you're left with up here are mainly uh, bare nuclei. And hydrogen has no electrons, helium has no electrons. It's just, helium is just an alpha particle, two protons, two neutrons, and then there's three electrons moving around. The way this interacts is again from uh, a gas like that is through what's called Bremsstrahlman emission. So here's a nucleus, here's an electron passing by. Uh, the, the passing electron is accelerated towards the nucleus. Maxwell's equations tell us that an accelerated charge radiates. So as, the, as this electron is pulled towards the nucleus, it's moving far too fast to be captured by the nucleus. So it just freely goes by. It produces Bremsstrahlman or breaking radiation. Uh, I frequently will call it Brim's radiation. It's also called free-free emission because the electron is free before the collision and it's free after the collision. So this is an extremely important source, even at low temperatures for uh, the radio part of the spectrum. Uh, so what we've been doing in the workshops, there's a, a workshop on cloudy 
going in parallel with this. So yesterday we we computed some uh, spectra for some points along this cooling function. And I'm gonna sh share one, uh, Viola, if you're here, thank you very much. So there were, we broke up into chunks of the class and computed uh, the spectrum at various temperatures along this uh, cooling function. So I'll take just a second to, the, the figures will look a lot like this. Uh, so just take a look, talk about this one. Uh, one of the remarkable charms about astronomy is that uh, we never use the same units for the wavelength or energy axis for light. So it's almost as a game. How many different kinds of units will, can we use? So sometimes you know, we might feel like using angstroms, other times microns, other times uh, maybe we put in kilovolts. If you feel inspired, you can put it in hertz or maybe uh, megahertz, gigahertz. Now we got Alma. So there's different, different um, units are used for this axis. Most of them are not SI units. We're supposed to use SI units. And it ends up becoming a struggle. One of the first struggles you have in working with a paper is you got to figure out the wavelength units. You have to figure out uh, the, you know, I, sometimes I work with papers in the x-ray part of the spectrum where they so, some figures give the spectrum in angstroms. And then you just look at the next figure over, the spectrum is given in kilovolts. So then you have to keep remembering how to convert actions into kilovolts. Okay, what I'm going to try to do, I'm trying to uh, have the self control to only use one system of units. So I said, I'm going to try to use my SI system of units. So the, uh, the micron is, a, is an SI unit. So this is the wavelength in, in microns. So this is the infrared radio over here. This is the visible part of the spectrum is here. Space telescope works down over here. This is the XUV and the FUV. Here's the, the X-ray and you're getting down into the very hard X-ray and gamma ray. So at this very, very high temperature, uh, the gas is extremely hot. The, so this might be the halo of a galaxy, clusters of galaxies, uh, the, the intercluster medium in clusters of galaxies is up at almost this temperature. So what you see being emitted, so this, this, is, this is what you would see if you had a, a telescope, if you look at this entire thing. So you see almost no emissions. This is the linear scale in this direction so that we can see where the strong emission is. So in that part of the cooling function, what's happening is you do have some lines. These are mainly transitions due to iron. Iron is charged 0.6. So you have, even in the hottest gas, you have the iron nucleus with a charge of 26, and then it can attract electrons and make recombination lines. That's what these guys are. The biggest uh, cooling though, is this broad band smooth continuum you see here, and this is the free free emission, the Brim's emission. So that's the uh, this emission process at very high temperatures. So the, at the very highest temperatures here, things are pretty simple because there are very few electrons left. And you get to this the peak in the cooling function here, this big chunk, and now we're down at say 10,000 degrees, 100,000 degrees. There's a, this is a very classical feature, a big peak in the cooling function. And so what these are, are mainly what are called electronic transitions in atoms that causes this. And so this is a, a, a simple energy level diagram for hydrogen. So this is the, the, the energy levels. Here's the ground state of hydrogen. This is the N equals two shell. Here's the N equals three shell. And then these are the various L, L stone, the orbital angular momentum. And then this is given in a scale so that these energies are relative to the ionization energy. And so this yellow band represents so much energy that uh, the electron is no orbiting electron, they're torn free. So this is energy this way and angular momentum. So these are L shells. These correspond to Bohr atom. These are the different orbits for the electron. You can think of it that way. And so th these transitions are mainly what are called electronic transitions. So electronic means the electron is moving between these, these electronic shells, n equals two, n equals three. Those are 
permitted by the selection rules of quantum mechanics. So these are what are called E1 transitions. If you've, if you've had Jackson, uh, that means that these are very fast transitions. And if you, uh, so these are mainly, not, not really hydrogen, hydrogen is not very important here. This temperature is high enough that hydrogen has no electrons orbiting its proton. But there's a lot of say carbon or oxygen that has orbiting electrons and can do electron jumps up and down. If you look at the spectrum at this point, so this is a million degree gas. Uh, you know, the first thing you see is um, the spectrum has shifted. It's shifted all the way. To, it's shifted, you know, two orders of magnitude. Uh, you'll find, you know, what region the spectrum is emitted is going to be proportional to the temperature, kind of linearly on this scale. The spectrum has shifted to longer wavelength by about two orders of magnitude. So Smidas Farman made this figure. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, showing that this gas at a million degrees, you know, we would not be able to detect this gas. It's a tragedy. From the Earth, we can't, you know, there's a huge selection effect. We can, with our visible ground-based telescopes, we can only see this region here. And you know, the really hot gas in this gas isn't emitting there. Uh, you know, in the radio telescope, well, you're probably going to have a hard time you know, working out here. You can't see it. And then the tragedy, you know, we'll never see this gas where, where it's strongly emitting because of the, the opacity of the ISM. The interstellar medium has a huge opacity at wavelengths that can ionize hydrogen just because of all the hydrogen in the ISM. And so the ionization potential of hydrogen is 912 angstroms or 0.09 uh, microns. So this part of the spectrum from here to here is blocked by the opacity of the ISM. So if you were, if we could have eyes that looked out around us and, and, uh, and looked at the ISM, the, the whole unit would be super cloudy. You wouldn't see much beyond the solar system. The ISM would would block our then be just black. Uh, so the only way we will ever detect emission in this part of the spectrum would be to build a starship and go a couple hundred parsecs above the plane so we could get above the interstellar matter. So you would have to this is this is an example of uh, the kinds of selection effects that, that we uh, we have to deal with in astronomy that we can't detect what nature may be doing in some cases. So what, so what are these? These are mainly, so we see entirely line emission. There is some brims coming out, but it's, it's weak. Mostly that peak in the cooling function of these lines. And these are, these are mainly electrons jumping between levels, carbon, oxygen, silicon, those kind of things. Keep on going down. Here is an energy level diagram from Osterbach. And now we're thinking about this part of the spectrum here. We get down towards the end of the fourth Kelvin. So here we finally, as human beings, we can see this. Or it turns out we can see gas down at this at this temperature. We, we would never be able to see this, this gas. So the transitions here are mainly what are called forbidden lines. So it means that, that they don't quite obey the uh, the simple selection rules of quantum mechanics, but they're still they don't violate conservation laws. These transitions. The, a famous one is this 03, 507, 49, 59 line. These are wavelengths in, in angstroms in air, but verbally, spectroscopists often refer to these lines. So it's this transition, this, this is the line that mostly is producing this rapid rise. Um, this is uh, the reason if you look at an H2 region in an optical telescope, a really big optical telescope, they look green. And that's, that's because this emission line is so strong. So these are what are called forbidden lines. And the forbidden lines are what are producing this. So the, the problem here, the kinetic energy of gas, say at 10,000 degrees, so 10,000 degrees corresponds to an energy of about one electron volt. So that's really not enough to excite electronic transitions in, in atoms, but it can, can excite these transitions. These are not change of electron shells. These are change of either the spin of the electron or the angular momentum of the electron orbit is what's changing here. 
So if you look at this, then uh, this is uh, Edwell did this figure. Thank you. Uh, what I think in microns and how uh, brighter it is. So here's this, the spectrum at 10,000 degrees. So we can see this part of the spectrum. HST can see down here, there's Lyman alpha. It's going to be a very strong line. So in our part of the spectrum, um, we can see uh, it's a, this is probably the 237 line. This is H alpha, uh, sorry, H beta, and uh, the O3 lines are here. Uh, the, uh, so we can see a strong emission here. And then if you can get it into the infrared, infrared observatories, there's a lot of strong lines out here. If we back up, the optical lines that we see are these transitions. And then the lines out in the infrared are, are caused by what are called, uh, uh, this, this is called the ground in atomic physics. This is the ground term of, of the atom. And these are levels. So this is change in levels in the ground term. And that produces these mid and far infrared lines. So it's different atomic physics. So all of this is many body Schrodinger equation in action. Uh, fortunately, we live at a time where uh, there are large computer codes exist that can solve the many body Schrodinger equation. So we have, uh, uh, we have great atomic data. And finally, uh, finally, we get down to this part uh, down here. So this is again, but once again, this is the ground term of O3. I just, I've just shown this. This is this is the ground state, the triple D ground term, and it has three J levels, transitions between that emit and the infrared. Uh, this gas is so cool it can't make any optical emission lines, but it can make these these ground term things. Uh, in the simulations we were doing in the workshop we don't didn't include grains and so the, the gas is not really going to form molecules unless you have grains present okay so there's uh that's what's happening if you look at a um, gas down at this temperature 100 kelvin not much of a spectrum it's uh it doesn't it's not it's not many strong lines this is of course a linear a linear spectrum if you want to work really really hard you can detect lines. There are lines here that are just very faint. The strong lines that, that really are the signature of this gas are out in the infrared. So you would, uh, it's easy to identify these lines, but that's what's responsible for that part of the fluid function. Okay, so tell you what, uh, it was it suggested that we stop and talk from time to time. So are there any questions? I'm just going to take a break. I'm not going to. I'm, so there are no don't... questions on the Slack uh, yet. There's no questions at all? Not yet. Okay. Yeah. okay, now's the chance to ask questions. You can raise your hand. You're among friends. Okay. Uh, well, let's go I guess back. I can continue a bit and uh, I'm sure there will be more questions. Oh, there is a question so just um, now. So is the cooling function which you showed at the beginning of your talk from the model, and what is the cause for the very sharp rise of the cooling function around 10 to the 4 Kelvin? Sure, that, is, that sharp rise, so th this, th this, is, uh, this is not exactly the model. This is a paper I did with Andy Baby a long time ago, but this is, uh, this is not exactly the uh, model we're doing in class because it, uh, you need to have grains included down here. We're doing a very simple model. We're going to talk, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, these bumps and grinds do depend on the composition of the gas. Uh, the overall features uh, have been the same now as they were 60 years ago. This, this is old stuff. This was known in the 1960s. The, but the individual features are very sensitive to atomic data and to the and in particular to the abundance of the composition you will see. Uh, so why the, the rapid rise? Well, the rapid rise is due to uh, the ability of the uh, electrons to excite these levels. So at this temperature here, so at this temperature, 
say, 5 to 4,000 Kelvin, 2,000 Kelvin. The electrons have, or the, the particles in the thermal gas, have temperatures about 0.1 or 0.2 electron volts. And so those, those particle collisions, if you have a, something moving at 0.1 electron volt and it hits O3, for instance, uh, well, the particle doesn't have a lot of energy. So it takes about one EV to get all the way up here. So at, 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 at that low temperature, it can't do that. It can only excite these guys. So, that's, that's, so these are in the infrared. That's here. At this magic temperature here, a spectacular range of temperature, uh, a spectacular, spectacular range of cooling for only a small change in temperature. What's happening is the electrons for the first time are able to ha have enough energy to excite these levels. And remember, in a way, a Maxwell, Maxwellian velocity distribution works, the distribution is exponential. So as you if you ask how many electrons can excite this, as you increase the temperature, uh, as the electron distribution can first start exciting it, the number of electrons that can do it goes up exponentially, which is why this rise in the temperature. I'll also talk about stability and how temperature of nebulae is set up in just a second, but this huge rise is also why most H2 regions in planetary nebulae have temperatures right about 10,000 Kelvin. Oh, many. Okay. Other questions? Thank you. So there are no other questions for the moment. So I guess you can sure. resume and stop again when you want. Okay. So I want to get into now the what's called the, the stability analysis. So what sets the temperature of interstellar matter? Well, if the system, okay, there's a lot of words here, we have to be very careful. So this is a highly non-equilibrium mm -hmm. system. So none of statistical mechanics don't, don't work here. Things like the Planck function, the, the Saha equation, the Boltzmann, they don't work. So we don't, we don't even use those things here. So this is highly non-equilibrium. But what we can do in the simplest case, uh, you can check, you can perform certain checks and see what the rate, what the time scale is for atomic processes to happen. So normally, it's, that depends on the density of the gas, but frequently atomic processes can, are occurring on time scales of seconds or minutes. So the collision time in a typical H2 region for an O3 sitting in the H2 region for an electron to hit it, the time scale for that to happen is, is half an hour, something like that. And then uh, the next thing you think about is the age of the system. How long has the system been that way? So an H2 region may have been this way for 100,000 years. And O stars are very short lived. You know, and, and the interstellar medium is very transient. So it's probably not hundreds of millions of years old, but certainly a few hundred thousand years old. And so the age of the system has been there for a couple hundred thousand years, maybe. And it, the atomic processes are happening on time scales of seconds or minutes. So you can assume that the atomic processes are time steady in, in some cases. Then there's ways you check that an important thing you want to do. So for what I'm doing here, we're assuming that the system is time steady so that the atomic processes are much faster than the macroscopic changes in the whole system. So what, in that case, we can see the following is now true. So what sets the temperature of the gas in this simple case? Well, there's some heating process, which I have drawn as this uh, blue line. So it could be shocks. So is what this heating process is doing is injecting two times 10 to the minus 23 ergs per cubic centimeter per second into this gas. And this, uh, this uh, this particular heating process is constant in general, but it varies with, uh, with temperature. It's uh, in many cases is photoionization. So the photoionization, the heating is starlight from the O star is absorbed by a hydrogen atom, probably in the ground state. So if the if the uh, 
uh, if the photoelectron, if the photon has say 20 electron volts of energy, a hydrogen atom takes 13.6 EV to ionize. So if the O star's 20 EV photon is a hydrogen atom, the first 13.6 EV will be used to tear the electron free. But then that photoelectron, the electron that was uh, torn free of the atom, now has 6.4 EV of kinetic energy. So it's ejected with a lot of energy. So the absorption of starlight makes energy. Another one that's very famous for PDRs is uh, starlight onto uh, grains, being absorbed by grains also creates heat for the gas. So that, these are heating processes. And then what the temperature is going to be is, is where heating is equal to cooling. And for this part of the cooling place, very classic, uh, there's three places where heating and cooling are equal. Now, if you think about this, if you have a huge range, it's a huge range of heating. Uh, if, if the heating is say 10 to 25, 10 to minus 25, there's only one place where this heating equals to cooling, and that will have a temperature of about 10,000 Kelvin. Um, and then if you think about say a heating rate of 10 to minus 23, say right here, there's only one place where it has a temperature and it's maybe 12,000 12, Kelvin. And so the reason that most nebulae in the sky have temperatures around 10,000 Kelvin is something you learn if you work with HQ regions because of this huge range in, in, in the cooling function. There's a problem though. There's some, there's some heating rates where there's three phases possible. So there's uh, three different solutions for this heating rate. You can have uh, three, 3 million Kelvin, you can have uh, 3 million Kelvin, that's, that's soft X-ray, Einstein XM, that, that gas is going to be detected by, by those observatories. There's this phase, it's a couple million Kelvin. This gas emits where we can't possibly see it because of the opacity of the ISM is a tragedy. And then we have this phase. This is down at 10,000 Kelvin, where uh, we, our optical telescopes, our eyeballs work here, and we would actually be able to see it. Okay, so you got three phases uh, that are possible. And then you get into what's called the stability analysis. They're stable and unstable phases. What does that mean? So what you do here is you do a Gadarkin experiment and you ask yourself, let's say we're, we're at this point right here. And in a stability analysis, if we have this, uh, uh, this temperature, uh, what happens if you disturb the thermal equilibrium? For instance, what if you have a solid gas in equilibrium at this temperature? What happens if you squeeze it and compress it and make it warmer because of compression? so that you uh, just change its temperature for, by a little bit, for, you perturb it a little bit. This is stable, because if, uh, if heating is equal to cooling here, if you make the gas too hot by moving the temperature up to here, what happens is the cooling increases. So now the cooling is bigger than the heating. So that's, not, that's not in balance. If the cooling is bigger than the heating, then it will cool off until heating is equal to cool. So the, the, in this positive slope here and here, the solution is stable. This is unstable. Anything with a negative slope is unstable. If you just think about it for a second, if you have heating equals cooling, and if you were to make it just a little bit hotter, what's happened now is that the heating is bigger than the cooling. So there's more heating than the cooling, so it'll get hotter still. So what will happen if you have gas here, if it just anything happens to it, it will zap over here to the hot phase. It, it will not, the so gas won't stay here. You can put it there. It's kind of like trying to, you know, get a, a pin to balance on its head. If you disturb it, if it falls over, it's falling. You know, it, 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 that tipping point will push it over. So the gas will end up here and here. So that means that uh, any slope that's negative uh, will be unstable. 
So it's very unlikely you'll have interstellar material here. You can have pockets of instability right here. The slope is coming up. Uh, this is stable. I don't know why there's nothing in the interstellar medium that we identify with, uh, with this range of temperatures. This is not stable. Uh, so the, 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 the uh, yes, the temperature is stable from a temperature of about 5,000 Kelvin up to a temperature of maybe 20,000 Kelvin. And then you get to this instability point and then you have this stable phase. So what would happen if you were to say, take a star and getting it closer and closer, increase the heating of some cloud. If you increase the heating, let's imagine the heating is here. So this is all stable. If you make the heating go bigger and bigger and bigger, what would happen is it would keep getting warmer and follow this stable phase until it got to this point right there. And then if you made it just slightly warmer, what will happen is it will jump over to this phase. There'd be a discontinuous jump it would happen over some time scale, perhaps hours. The gas would jump over here. And this is this is stable. It's an interesting question why we never see it, but we don't. But uh, here's here's a stable phase. If you keep increasing the heating, it'll go up to here and then it'll stop there. Increase the heating now, and now it's the uh, uh, next stability point will be in the hard x rays. The other way you would, so that's a, a gas heating up. The same is true for a PDR. You take the gas here, start heating it up, heating it up. It would be stable through here until it gets to about three, 4,000 Kelvin. And then the next stable point is up at 10,000 Kelvin. So you see these, these discontinuous jumps. The, other, the opposite thing you do, so the, the red arrows are the trajectory, the stable phases for gas that's heating up. The, the blue, uh, sorry, the black arrows are, are stable phases for gas is cooling down. So if you start gas with heating equals cooling over here, and then if you turn down the heating, turn down the heating, the temperature comes down like this until you, you get to this point here. And if you turn the heating down just a little bit more, the next stable point is the gas will change from 10 to the seventh Kelvin and jumps way over here at 10 to the fourth Kelvin. So the huge. So this would this would happen over some time scale. It would take some time for the gas to move, but it would scoot over here on the, on the cooling time scale as fast as it could. And then if you keep cooling it down, it would it'd be, it's on the stable phase here until it gets to that point here, maybe five thousand Kelvin. And then if you make it a little bit cooler, then it jumps way over here to a thousand Kelvin. So that's why. That's the physical reason why ionization fronts, the you know, H2 regions, say the M16 image that we've been looking at in the workshop, there's a very sharp ionization front at the rim of an H2 region. And so that's where the gas is jumping from this phase over to this phase. So all of this, so there are these phases that are possible. And this is all the result of the many body Schrodinger equation working for us. So those are the stable phases now as drawn as the as has these, these boxes. So that's where you expect to see the interstellar medium, and that's how we're going to build our galaxy with gas in that in these phases. Okay. So then if you with those phases, with these, with these phases, what can you build? Okay, well, uh, this is a classic. A uh, simple model of uh, interstellar cloud. So what you start out with, uh, the energy source of the star cluster down here. Star clusters are, young stars are extremely windy. They, they, uh, they, they uh, have strong, powerful winds going off. These winds create tremendous shocks. And so the star cluster forms a, a hot bubble, which plus bubble. Uh, mechanically heated wind. So this will be up in the in Orion, uh, so uh, a couple million Kelvin. And so, so this thing, you can think of it as being in rough pressure equilibrium. These, these phases are in pressure equilibrium with one another. So something like a hydrostatic equilibrium. Uh, so the, the, the hot gas makes this hot bubble that's holding the whole thing up. 
And then we, what we've got here is a molecular cloud. So the stars are always formed very close to molecular clouds. This is drawn as a sphere. So this one might be stars that got born inside the molecular clouds or deep inside the molecular cloud. So here is the molecular cloud itself. So this is uh, H2. Uh, these different regions have different names. They're, they're, they emit in different parts of the spectrum. They're studied by different people and they, uh, they have different names. But it's just this one common geometry. So what there is, is this layer where the ionizing radiation is interacting with the molecular cloud and you end up with successive layers of, uh, of stability. So the first layer you hit is the, uh, the H plus layer. So the problem, you think of this, first of all, uh, so Don Osterbrock, early when I was working with him, uh, his, one of his favorite teachers when he was a student in Chicago was Enrico Fermi. And Fermi got Don a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And so when Don got there, he was, Don Osterbach said he was once in the same room with Einstein, who was there, although he didn't meet him. Uh, Strömgen was the director, and Strömgen was the person who gave us the name H2 region for what we call H2 regions. And so that's a, that's a mistake, is what it is, and Don says he told him. <laughs> so there's no, it's, it's called H2 because this is a, a, a mistaken uh, indication of the ionization of the gas. In atomic physics, this is an indication of a spectrum. Not, not, this is a spectrum, not a baryon. What it, what it is is an H plus region. There isn't any such thing as an H2 spectrum, but it doesn't even exist. So, so Don, <laughs> walking up to Osterbach, to Osterbach, but walking up to Schirmgen and told him that. But, uh, uh, the problem with this name is there's two H2 regions. So there's two, there's an H2 region here, and there's an H2 region here. This is the real H2 region with, with molecular hydrogen. So, uh, okay, well, then I, I've gone on to calling this, they have different names. This is frequently called the H2 region. This is frequently called the BDR. This is frequently called the, uh, the molecular cloud. This is really the H2 region, the H0 region, hydrogen is atomic here. And here it's, it's ionized, if you think of it from the physics. So here we have a region where the ionizing radiation is striking the cloud. We're on that huge uh, stable part of the cooling function. So let's see if we can go back. So this is this part of the stability curve. And uh, that's also why H2 regions normally have temperatures of, of uh, 10,000 Kelvin. So, there's a, so the ionizing radiation penetrates and holds the temperature of this H plus layer. Eventually the ionizing radiation is absorbed by the, by the layer and uh, no more hydrogenization going on because of the absorption of all the, that part of the starlight. Hydrogen recombines and it jumps over to an atomic phase. So this would correspond to going over down here and jumping over to this phase. So this is the, the PDR phase. So there's this, this very thin layer, called, often called a PDR, which uh, and it stands for two different things, photon dominated region, the photo dissociation region. These they have the same initials. Uh, so the baryons that are present are atomic hydrogen, molecular hydrogen. So these are temperatures, maybe a thousand Kelvin. And then finally, uh, that even that is, uh, the radiation is absorbed when you get down to the, uh, the molecular cloud. So here we have lots of chemistry. So that's a simplified geometry. I just want to see a couple of pictures of this geometry. So this is the cooling function at work. Uh, so this is 30 Doradus. This is the nearest starburst to the Earth. This is the, the most luminous star group starburst in the local group. So we have a cluster of stars that's formed here. This is a visible light image. And you have this super patchy, okay, H plus layer. This is, this is, this is the you know, NH2 region using Hermann's name. So this is, uh, looks like it's a, a Swiss cheese. It's got all these holes. 
It's got the star cluster with hundreds. It's got it's got hundreds of O stars. The you know, Orion would not be visible at this distance. Uh, Orion is powered by one star, really, and this has hundreds of stars that are powering it. So we look at it the visible light. Uh, so what we see the visible light is we see only this thin layer here. So what I'm going to do next is uh, Lisa Townsley made this image where she added the X-ray emission from an X-ray observatory. And so we're going to see an image that has both the visible light from here, but also this hot gas here. So it's going to show both this, this phase and this phase. So here we go. So there's the... Uh, here, here's the credit. So there's uh, the same image. And what you see, the blue is the, the hot gas, the mechanically heated uh, hot gas at 10, you know, a million, 10 million Kelvin. And then the red is the HQ region. So this is probably uh, maybe this is even infrared and dust. So what you see is that the uh, it's not really the Swiss cheese you think it is. It has these these uh, sort of empty regions visibly, but with it's filled with hot gas, and so it's these two different phases, and the hot gas is mechanically heated. And the way the numbers worked out is indeed the pressure in the hot gas is about the same as the pressure here. You see this geometry all over the place. So this is what's called the cat's eye nebula. Yohan Chu did this, I believe. So on the left is an HST image, and what she did was add, so you see these empty cavities. So here, this is a, a planetary nebula. So this is a star at the very end of its life through the Aratus. It's a complex at the beginning of life. And so the uh, this is a white dwarf that's dying and it's ejected uh, its outer layers. You should see this, and these things are windy. The stellar wind, you know, goes off at thousands of kilometers a second and hits the surrounding material, creating shocks, creating million degree gas. The X-ray observatories can detect that. So you see the X-ray emission in blue here fills these these voids. So it's, so you really get only a, a an inkling of the of the geometry when you just look in the in the optical or the UV. The similar thing happens in um, in the infrared. You can see the transition into the, the, the PDR. Okay, so that's the stability. Uh, how about if we stop there for for questions? Maybe a nice breaking point. So if you want to stop for a few questions, there are several in the chat. Okay. Um, do you have a chat window up? I, I can. Yeah, I mean, I can read it. So there is one sure. about the layers. So are layers of H2 regions, PDR, and molecular clouds stable or varying in shape because of turbulence or other processes? Okay, how do they change with time? Uh, over time scales of a lifetime, you know, we have imaging of the Orion Nebula going back to the 1880s, I believe. And uh, over human lifetimes, it, these are not changing. The ISM is, is very dynamic. Uh, so the, you know, the whole picture, I'm sure many lectures have gone into this and there's fountains going off, and molecular clouds are forming and they, they, then they make stars and then uh, the star destroys the molecular cloud. Thank you, mother, for doing, giving birth, you know. So uh, it's, a, it's all a very dynamic environment. But what it turns out, if you, when you look at the, uh, these geometries, we've seen they are they're not exactly, but as near as you can tell, they're in pressure equilibrium, they're hydrostatic. And so, you know, this, that's not a strong statement. That's within a factor of two. Uh, you can, it's hard to measure the pressure in the X-ray. but. Uh, in as much as you're able to measure the pressures, the pressures are in balance. So these these should be uh, systems that will be, be sitting there for time scales of 100,000 years, say hundreds of thousands. You know, but uh, there are a lot of things that are changing. That you know, these massive O stars that make 30 Uranus are very short-lived, just millions of years. And so the, the 
the oh, the, the brightest young stars in Orion only have lifetimes of millions of years. So the uh, the geometry itself is going to change over time scales to something like that. But to set up the you get into this question, so this the macroscopic geometry is changing. But then the atomic physics is really fast, much faster than these bigger changes. And so the what you're actually seeing is not changing before your eyes because atomic physics is, is time steady. It's come it, it's come into balance. Does that answer the question? Let me see if I can find. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, maybe another one. Is the cooling function that you showed uh, for a particular metallicity, and how would it change uh, with a different metallicity? Sure, uh, so that's a great question. Um, the cooling function right now isn't the same as it was 10 years ago, and that's because the oxygen abundance of the sun is different. So what this is assuming, uh, if you go to very high temperatures, normally you assume that dust has been destroyed. And the uh, in that case, the, the elements that are feeded on the dust would come back into the gas phase. And so that particular calculation was for solar abundances as they existed in 2009. Uh, the solar composition hasn't changed, but our measurements of it has changed. And so there's uh, that will change things. So it's the, you know, the, it's the, it's the atomic physics of the oxygen or the carbon at 100,000 degrees, 10,000 degrees is, is what's doing it. Uh, so two things that change are the, the atomic data are getting better the atomic data for things like O3, uh, nitrogen 2, those things are, are very well known today. So we, we, we live in a happy time, but then the, the abundance as you assume it, it can be different. And that changes where the stability points are. So for instance, if you assume there's dust present, then that removes some of the oxygen, removes some of the carbon, removes all the titanium, removes most of the iron from the gas phase. And that would change this cooling function. And so it depends, yeah, it depends. There's no universal cooling function. But the general big bumps, that's, that's atomic physics, the, you know, the big bump at 1,000 Kelvin, the big bump at 100,000 Kelvin, that's different transitions, that's basic atomic physics. Those bumps are still there, but the, the details, the shape of the bump, it depends on details. Okay, maybe a small one uh, for the last one. So what does the local minima in the graph of the cooling function signify? Here, or which, which local minimum? I think that's what, uh, yes, that was probably what uh, this person was referring Okay, well, it doesn't signify particularly anything. It's just how the, you know, the electron interactions have changed. But what the local minimum represents is it's the last stable point. If you're cooling, if the gas is cooling off, it's stable until it gets here. And then that's the last stable point and it jumps over there. Same here. So there's no deeper, so it's a, it's a stability point. And so when you go, look out the interstellar medium, you, 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 you see phases that are stable. That's, that's why we, we have the phases we see. So it, there's no deeper significance than that. Okay, thank you. So you have about 45 minutes left uh, of talk and five more minutes of question. Okay. so. What I'm going to do uh, next is, so that's kind of the physics that sets up the structures. So we had two questions at the beginning. There was the, the, the H alpha imager of the sky. So you have these things that we see around us. Why do they look the way they do? Well, okay, it's the shape of the cooling function sets up the geometry. So when you, when you see these geometries on the sky, that's the many body Schrodinger equation that's causing that the cooling function and the stable points. The next thing I want to go off talking about is it's a big industry in astronomy is how you measure the composition of the interstellar medium. And so I'm going to do this from an optical point of view, the visible light, because there's a lot of literature, a lot of big telescopes are used to 
measure the composition of the interstellar medium. Uh, you can also do this in the radio and the infrared, but it's harder because hydrogen doesn't emit strongly there. So this is uh, an example of the problem in front of us. This is uh, Orion and um, I understand where we are. Uh, so this is the Orion Nebula is this, the star cluster, the, the trapezium is this uh, small group of stars right here. This is the sword of Orion. If you, during the constellations, you can see this with your naked eye. So we're looking now, so this is a, a layer, it's a pancake, it's a layer of ionized gas on this side of the molecular cloud, it's called OMC1, I have molecular cloud one. We'll talk about this geometry in just a sec. So this is a, a thin layer on the surface of the molecular cloud, as we saw. If you point your telescope at it, this is a figure from the Osterbach book. Uh, this is what you see in the optical spectrum. We didn't label the axis, and it's also not SI. So this is an example of the, of the switching units for the wavelength axis. So this is an angstroms, and we didn't label it. Um, so here is the visible part of the spectrum, the human eye, as you can see from here to here. This is the green part of the spectrum. So this is where the human eye is most sensitive. Space telescope can see down, down here. So the thing before us is we wanna look at this spectrum and measure the composition of this part of the interstellar medium. So what you've got here is a hydrogen line, H beta, this is the Balmer line. So this is the N equals four to N equals two shells of hydrogen. This is uh, uh, Balmer alpha, and this is the three to two, it's even stronger. Okay, so we've got some signatures of hydrogen and here we have uh, oxygen, uh, three. And uh, let's think about the problem. We're trying to figure out the oxygen abundance from the O3 to H beta ratio. Okay, so we're gonna focus in on this narrow part of the spectrum here. We've got a hydrogen line here and we've got the, the, the O3 lines here. So this is, this is H plus jumping with an electron, recombining, and then this electron cascades down. It produces this line. These lines are produced by electrons hitting an O double plus and causing an excitation that makes these lines. So this is an example of cooling. The energetic electron gave its kinetic energy to exciting the H O plus plus, making these emission lines. So we want to, how do, how do we get the, the, the abundance out of this? So if you, this is a, a problem we're going to do in a cloudy workshop in a while, in a bit. So let's ask ourselves, uh, let's imagine that we change the metallicity by uh, three orders of magnitude. So this is the, uh, and starting out at solar. So here's the log of the metallicity. This is solar right here. And we're going to get, so this is metallicity relative to solar. So this is one tenth solar, this is a hundredth of solar, and it goes up to 10 times solar. So we vary the metallicity over a huge factor. And this is, this is, this is simple. This is how the oxygen to hydrogen ratio changes. So the number of oxygens relative to the number of hydrogen changes by the same ratio, it changes by three orders of magnitude. So this is a, a spectacular change in the composition of the gas. So then if we uh, do the same, if, if we now we turn on cloudy, so nothing magical about cloudy, it's just obeying, obeying the laws of atomic physics. It's solving, uh, it's solving for the temperature of the gas by balancing heating and cooling. So we're gonna, we're gonna turn on all of cloudy and we're gonna ask ourselves, we have a star next to a cloud and we're gonna vary the metallicity by three orders of magnitude. And we're gonna ask ourselves how this line relative to this line changes. So let me ask you, so how would you think 
significantly. If you vary the oxygen to hydrogen abundance by three orders of magnitude, how would this change? Now, we've all been in schools way too long. When you hear a question like that, you know that's a trick question. And it is indeed a trick question because our intuition, our guess is completely, totally asymptotically wrong. Uh, what, what you would guess is if you double the oxygen abundance, these lines will become twice as strong. Uh, if you cut the oxygen in half, you would guess these lines would become half as strong. That's not how it works, because this is heating equals cooling. As this, and this is a strong cooling. So heating and cooling will always be equal. So what actually happens if you change the oxygen abundance, uh, the O3 doesn't change much at all. We'll see that. What does change is the temperature where heating and cooling are equal. Okay, so uh, this is just to get on the same page. So this is going back to the metallicity. Here's the, uh, the metallicity, three orders of magnitude. Now, what, this is a cloudy calculation predicting the O3 to H beta ratio, but what we did is we turned off the temperature solver. So it's not trying to make heating and cooling match. So this is not the thermal equilibrium. So we say the gas temperature, let's freeze the gas temperature at 10,000 Kelvin and then bury this oxygen abundance by this much. So what you would see is the O3 to H beta ratio changes by, by three orders of magnitude. So in this simple case, you've turned off the temperature solver. We may imagine in our heads the temperature stayed the same. And, um, and these lines are broken down by that much. This is what really happens if you turn on the temperature solver. This is also what happens in, in nature. So this shows the uh, uh, O3 to H beta ratio for temperature for metallicity changing by three orders of magnitude. What a what a bummer. Uh, basically, the O3 to H beta ratio for most of these metallicities is only changing by a factor of two. And so for, let's say O3 H beta equals to one. Well, when you go all the way down to 1% of solar, it's uh, half of that. You go up to solar-ish, this may be twice that. You get up to solar, it's back to one. It's only when you get to super uh, high metallicities that, the, that it starts changing. So, you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's bad news. Because that means you can look all over the sky at all these H2 regions all over the place. And you see uh, that the O3 to H beta ratio is always about the same. And so you would hope that would tell you the oxygen abundance is always about the same. And it doesn't tell you anything. It, uh, it's just telling you how the cooling function works. So this is uh, what's called the... Uh, what's called the thermostat effect. And so what happens in the thermostat effect is that the heating and cooling and that cooling function are going to be equal to the cooling time scale in the Orion Nebula is less than an hour. So if, this, if, this, if the geometry is stable for an hour, it will come into thermal balance for the H2 region. And so what happens is if you take if you, the thermo, it's called the thermostat effect. This was known 80 years ago, not new news. Uh, what happens is you increase the oxygen abundance. Uh, oxygen is a very strong cooling. And so what happens, heating equals cooling. So what happens is the temperature of the gas goes down to keep the oxygen lines about the same. So the number, if, if the number of cooling atoms increases, temperature falls, keep the cooling the same. So what is changing? So, so here we have oxygen three, not change, the lines are not changing a lot. What is changing systematically is the temperature of the gas. So here's 10,000 degrees, the magic temperature for most nebulae. And the, the temperature is systematically falling as you, as you increase the, the metallicity. So you really have to measure the temperature very accurately in order to measure the, the metallicity of something. You 
can't just look at the strong lines. Okay. Another way to think of this, this is my favorite picture of an H2 region. This is one of the pillars of creation for the, uh, from the famous HST image of M16. So what you have here are these fingers of molecular gas. This is a molecular cloud here. And then a couple of parsecs away, there's a really hot O star. It's like O2, O3, O4, something like that. It's much hotter than the stars in Orion. Starlight is hitting the surface of the molecular cloud and it's creating an ionized layer. And we, we, in this case, we happen to see it edge on. We can see what's going on. And this is exactly what's happening in Orion, but in Orion, we don't see it edge on, we see it face on. So when we look at Orion, uh, we're, we're viewing it from the left. We're looking at it like this. We see a flat pancake on the sky. And then the molecular cloud that we call OMC1 is behind it. Uh, so, the, so Orion is tricky. It took a long time to figure out the, the geometry of Orion. Uh, this is a much simpler example. So this is where the this, this stable phase is around 10,000 Kelvin here. And then this is where you jump phases over to the thousand degree phase in the PDR star. This is a very sharp ionization frontier. So what the thermostat effect was saying shown here is that this ionized layer really emits about the same amount of power no matter what the oxygen abundance is. And the, the total emission from this ionized layer is really set by how much power is coming in starlight. It's not set by the oxygen abundance. And so that means the oxygen spectrum is not changing very much. You really do need to measure the temperature pretty well. So strong optical forbidden lines are the main cooling. Their intensity is set by the heating, the starlight, rather than the abundance. So the abundance has changed. So you need, if you want to measure the abundance, you need to measure the temperature. OK, so this brings into a question, which is sort of a, a red herring that got thrown out in the last 10 years. Uh, and that's the question whether a well-defined temperature exists. And that, well, there's two parts of it. There's, there's this recent question about whether electrons are, are really Maxwellian. That's, uh, I think, in my mind, is a very silly question. Because Spitzer showed 70 years ago that the electrons have a temperature in nebulae. Uh, we just cannot ignore all that work Spitzer did. We, we ignore that work at our peril. He wrote a book in 1962 called The Physics of Fully Ionized Plasmas. And that book shows why it is that the particles, the electrons in a nebulae like this, have a temperature and have a well defined Boltzmann distribution, Maxwellian. Um, the second thing that exists is something Manuel Pembert is a more reasonable question. You see something like this is a planetary nebula, this is a shell of gas ejected from a dying star. Uh, you can see it's extremely patchy and homogeneous. It does one temperature exists. This is uh, what's often called a T squared problem. So you can see it's extremely patchy and things are jumping around. And so, this, so there's two different things that you see being discussed right now in the literature. There's the question, the T-squared question, which is very fundamental, uh, that Manuel Pembert's, uh, I think his paper was 1967. This is still an open question. So then there's uh, a lot of work is happening in some groups to try to solve this problem. And then there's a, a second uh, question, which is what's called the kappa electrons. And that um, kappa electron problem is the postulating that the electrons don't have an Maxwellian distribution. They do. It's known. It's been known rock solid since Spitzer. And ignoring the Spitzer work, I mean, it's it's not a it's not an interesting question to ask, because if you look at the rates, the the electron, the processes that would make the electrons not have a temperature by Maxwell, by kappa electron, those processes are insignificant by 10 orders of magnitude. No matter how bad the theory is, we're not off by 10 orders of magnitude. The, the 
max electrons are in max volume. Okay, so part one. This is the T squared problem. So this is a, a very important paper by Manuel Timber. Does the temperature exist? And so uh, this is the biggest unsolved problem in nuclear astrophysics. The basic problem here is if we go way back to the cooling function, uh, the cooling function has this screeching big rise in cooling over a narrow range in, in temperature. So if things are changing, say if the heating is changing by a lot, the temperature does not change by a lot because of this steep increase. And so theoretically, because of this steep curve, you expect nebulae to be fairly isothermal, to have this kind of one temperature because of, because of this steep rise. So that's a robust theoretical prediction for ages and ages. And so Manuel proposed, and others now have further developed, um, and further developed spectroscopic methods to check whether there's more in the wall defined temperature and uh, what you find is that the observational diagnostics don't agree. And so the postulate here, the T-squared postulate, is that the temperature is, is different in kind of random ways in different places. And uh, so this, this I, I consider the biggest unsolved puzzle in uh, nebular astrophysics. Theoretically, you know, you, you know where the theory, I don't have any telescopes, don't have access to telescopes, I have a computer. And so I, I always think of it from the numerics or from the, uh, the theory side. You don't expect to have big temperature variations because you, it's very hard to get the equilibrium tip to change very much. But the spectroscopic observations don't go, won't go away. And so it's, it's still there and it's a really big problem. And it, needs, it really does need to be solved. This problem has been sitting there since 1967. There is a second problem, which uh, was fundamental and it was solved in the 1950s. Spitzer wrote several large review papers in the mid to late 50s, which have thousands of citations that show this is that the electrons are max volume. Spitzer wrote a book in 1962 called Physics of Ionized Nebula. And sorry, Physics of an Ionized Plasma. And there are two simple tests that you get from Spitzer's work. You can you apply these simple tests and you can ask yourself whether the electron velocity distribution is Maxwellian. So this is this is this this so it's been postulated that the electrons are not Maxwell and then nebulae, but they're what's called a kappa distribution. And so this is a figure from one of the papers that go into this. And this just shows the, the velocity distribution. So this is a Maxwellian, it looks like that. And a kappa distribution is very different. It has a high energy tail and so basically, uh, so what's the simple reason why kappa distributions don't happen? The reason is if you take a, a, an ion, any electrons, we're talking about electron distribution, the electrons are the fastest particles in a thermal gas. Remember half mv squared equal to nkt. In thermal gas, v squared is proportional to t. mv squared is the energy of motion. t is the thermal energy, they're equal. That means that the velocity depends on the square root of the mass. So the lightest particles have the highest speed. So the highest speed particles are gonna be the electrons. Then you ask yourself, what's the most common collision? Well, the most common collision is gonna be electron electron collisions. By far, it's orders and orders of magnitude more of those than oxygen electron collisions. And that's because there's so many electrons and they're moving so fast. There's 10,000 times more electrons than oxygen atoms. So you think about electron-electron collision, that's what's called a, a homonuclear collision. It means it's the same thing colliding. The homonuclear molecules like H2. So 
the problem with the homonuclear collision is it has no dipole moment, it doesn't make light. So what happens if you get in the center of mass frame, if you watch two electrons, if I'm, I'm the center of mass, here's two electrons, my fists, if they're gonna collide, when they collide, they just do that. And so in the, in, in the, in the, in the laboratory frame watching this, nothing happened really. And so they don't emit light. Electron-electron collisions are elastic collisions. They don't emit light. Elastic collisions are what you need to make a maximilian. Spitzer showed this. And so the, 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 the forces driving it to a maximilian are very, very powerful. So what we did, uh, first of all, I found it very annoying. Why am I redoing something that was known before I was born? Okay, but I did. We wrote this paper saying that the cathodes don't exist. And it was a lot of fun working with Manuel Pimpert, Will Henny, and Bob Odell. And then uh, Drain has also written a paper which has this. Uh, we just did, we just followed the, the Spitzer uh, what Spitzer had done in the 1950s. So we just redid work that was 70, 60 years ago. Uh, Drain actually did a numerical calculation where he followed a high energy electron in a thermal gas and showed that, and basically he showed that Spitzer got the right answer in the 1950s. Uh, so the electrons are Maxwellian, and the kappas don't exist. Okay, so that's the end. Um, I think I'm three minutes over time. I will stop the share and uh, I guess it's time for questions. Okay, I mean, you have more time if you want, but uh, we can uh, do some questions. Done. Um, so I'm taking questions. So is uh, the X-ray emission expected in every H2 regions or only in H2 regions with very hot stars or supernova environments? Uh, you know, so all okay. There's two kinds of H. Okay, all H2 regions have hot stars. That's the definition of an H2 region. So um, the nearest one, the really brightest one, is the Orion Nebula, and so it has a star cluster in the center. And for I don't I don't have the image with me. I'm not going to look for it. Um, but yeah, people looked at Orion. They didn't notice the soft X-ray emission. But the reason for that. Is there's a layer, there's a lot of junk in the Orion environment. There's a layer, a translucent layer in front of the Orion Nebula that's able to absorb the X-rays. And so there has been Chandra imaging looking not directly at the star cluster, but looking away. And so Orion is kind of a sculpted cavity in OMC-1 and there's the hot gases flowing off in one direction. I look on the sky, it's flowing off to the right. And uh, if you look off to the right, you can see the hot X-ray emission there. So in the case where you couldn't see it for a long time, like Orion, that was only because the X-rays were absorbed. So the two things I would say, first of all, all those all these two regions have O stars, because what this is, is the molecular cloud that gave birth to massive stars. And then the, all those stars are very short lived and all those stars are windy. I know it's been the, 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 that, that is the biggest discovery that came out of UV astronomy. All those stars have winds around them. And so there's, um, you're always going to get this hot bubble. So the, the hot bubble forms the foundation for building the H2 region. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. So is the sharp rise, I guess it's the sharp rise in the cooling function, equivalent to the DN4000 break that we usually see in galaxies, con uh, galaxies continuum emission? And the DN4000 break, it's a 4000 Armstrong break that we see. Yeah, that's that's a property of the SED of the stars, right? And so that's the... Uh... Uh, that's caused by changes in the opacity in the solar atmosphere. So that's, that's completely different from this. Okay. Um, so do the temperatures that correspond to the stable phases fully overlap for the different metallicities, causing all temperatures to be reachable for the gas in the stable phases? 
the shapes uh, do depend on metallicity and people that have been papers where they've changed the metallicity by a lot. And you can you see that uh, the stable phases uh, change. Probably the most famous example would be uh, first stars at the reionization epoch because that the, the interstellar material forming stars then are forming it out of primordial material. So, you, so that's why there's a, you know, a lot of work on H2 cooling, HD cooling, that sort of thing. And so uh, that forms its own cooling function. So yeah, it changes quite a bit, but the, the uh, a way to think of it, if you get into atomic physics, and so the, you know, this is all atomic physics, the the lines in the infrared um, that dominated a thousand Kelvin are change of level, and then uh, the lines in, in in atomic physics the levels changing. So it might in the O3 case it's have the three J levels inside the triplet P ground state, and then the lines that dominate at so that's that's one that's that's the, the change of level. And then the, so it's an electron doing this thing there. And then the, the lines that dominate at uh, uh, 10,000 Kelvin, you know, the O3 lines in the optical, that's change of term. So the electrons are going say some, from the singlets to the triplets. They're forbidden lines, but there's, that's a much bigger energy change. The change of level, change of term. And then the huge peak in the cooling function at 100,000 Kelvin this change of configuration is going from n equals one to two to three. So it's, that's uh, changing configuration. So, so the general shape is basic Schrodinger equation over electron orbits, change of level, change of term, change of configuration. So that that's basic, that's very basic atomic physics, but the, the details all depend very much on the composition you you, uh, you assume okay um, could you speculate further on the stable region of the cooling curve at which there is no observed gas so around 10 to the 5 kelvin yeah i i don't know uh, what's going on there uh it ought to be there there's nothing the you know, first thing you wonder, well, is there a big bug and cloudy and it doesn't really exist? Well, you know, this, this goes back to work Don Cox did in the 1960s, uh, John Raymond. You know, this has been known, it's been known for, you know, probably longer than most people on this Zoom have been alive. But it's, you know, it really is there. Uh, there ought to be nebulae at 100,000 Kelvin. Uh, they would emit, so, we, so there is a forbidden region. We can't observe emission between 912 angstroms and about 200 electron volts. So we can, we can see down to about Lyman Alpha with Space Telescope, and then we can't, so we're forbidden, we can't see anything until we get out to the soft x-rays. So maybe 0.2 kev, 0.5 kev. So there's that forbidden region of the spectrum that we'll never see. And maybe there, so those, could there be a class of objects that's emitting in those, in that forbidden region that uh, we don't notice? Um, the other thing though is, uh, if we were to uh, go to, why am I having trouble? I'm going to uh, go back to the PowerPoint in the slideshow. Okay. So I'm going to share my, yeah, okay, so let's go back here. Um, just be a second. Here we go. What I'm going to do is share my screen one more time. Okay, so we're looking at this. Uh, this thing. So the question then is, why don't you see nebulae up in this phase here? Maybe you better look at that. Uh, we, these are all the H2. This is you know very common. Here's PDR liquid clouds, and here's the hot bubbles. Why don't we see this? I wish I knew the answer. 
if you think about you know, going a gas cooling down, it'll never reach here because the gas cooling down will jump from here to here. But a gas heating up, it goes from the PDR molecular cloud, jumps over to the, the H plus, you know, the H2 region phase. So then there should be this 50,000 Kelvin region before it heats over to the uh, mechanically heated hot bubble over there. Yeah, I don't, you know, I've wondered this for a long time. If you actually, you know, just compute the spectrum, the 50,000 degree gas, it should have a spectrum we could measure. It's not, uh, if you get up to a million degrees, that's only emitting in that forbidden region. We can't see, but we should be able to see this. I wish I knew the answer. Thank you. Another question. Uh, isn't the presence of gas at temperature between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 6 K just due to the fact that the medium is not in equilibrium? Well, I'm sure you could come up with something. Uh, for this, okay, for this to happen, what you, you okay. The questions I would ask is what's the cooling time? And so you that's something Cloudy reports. And so it's a cooling time. So the cooling time uh, depends on the uh, density. So high density gas cools very fast, low density gas cools very slowly. And then so then you ask, you know, what is the cooling time? So that's going to depend on the situation. And then you ask yourself, how rapidly is the heating source changing? So if the heating source is changing very quickly relative to the cooling time, then the, the gas will just kind of be chasing the, the heating source and never catch up with it. And so that, uh, that will be a, a case where the temperature will be changing, trying to accommodate the heating. But if the heating is changing at you know, more slowly than the cooling time, and that's what normally happens in H2 region because uh, the heating is the O star. The O star is sitting there, so it's moving, but it's not moving fast. So the, the, if for the case of Orion, the crossing time for the, for the, the, the O stars in Orion to cross the, the H2 region, though that those time scales are tens of thousands of years. And so over, going from us to back to Egyptian times, maybe the O stars have moved, but uh, they're moving very slowly. And then the geometry has probably been there for hundreds of, th hundreds of thousands of years. And that is many, many, many orders of magnitude slower than the cooling time. So the, so you, so if, the if the cooling time is three orders of magnitude faster than the changes in the heating, so, so in that example, the heating can change because the stars get closer or farther away or the stars explode or something like that. Uh, if, if, the, if the heating is stable for 100,000 years, but in the, so I happen to know these numbers because I work on Orion a lot. The heating, the stars are stable for hundreds of thousands of years, not, not tens of millions of years, but hundreds of thousands of years. And then the, the uh, cooling time for the gas in the Orion Nebula is about an hour. And so uh, I would say from that comparison, the, the, the gas should be in thermal equilibrium with the heating. Uh, that's not true for molecular gas. So, so the molecules, uh, there's, a, there's an old saying in atomic physics, that a diatomic molecule is one atom too many. Uh, when you get into molecular gas, uh, the situation changes dramatically. Two things are, are the cause of that. One, and it all comes down to a half mv squared equals nkt. Half mv squared is kinetic energy, K nkt is the thermal energy. So when you get to very, very low temperatures, the speeds slow down. So that means the time scales for collisions slow down. And so it, you know, 10 Kelvin or 100 Kelvin, uh, well, mv squared is kt. So if you lower the temperature from 
10,000 degrees in the H2 region to uh, the H plus region to 100 Kelvin in the H2 region, the molecular cloud, that's 100 times lower temperature. So the speeds have fallen by uh, mv squared kt. So uh, the speeds have fallen by a factor of 10. Everything's moving 10 times more slowly. And the second thing that really hurts in molecular environments is the mass. So m v squared. So in, um, in, the, in the H2, in an ionized gas, when we're thinking about electrons, they're very light. So they're the fastest moving particles. So an electron is 2,000 times lighter than a proton. So an electron is moving about uh, 40 times faster than an electron. So the electron is moving 40 times faster than a proton. They're really moving fast. And you get into a molecular environment, you're talking about molecules. These are really big, massive things. So you're talking about CO, for instance, the carbon's got a mass of 12 times hydrogen. Oxygen has got a mass of 16. You add those up, that's 28. So this the carbon monoxide is moving square root 28 times more slowly than a hydrogen atom. So the, in, in uh, molecular regions, uh, because of the low temperatures and the high mass of the particles you're dealing with, the time scale is much slower. So that's why, in general, molecular clouds are not in equilibrium, thermal equilibrium. So that's uh, uh, a very, very big distinction. So, thing you get into a PDR or a molecular cloud, uh, the time scales for the for the geometry to stabilize get very, very long because the masses involved are very big and the temperatures are small. So the collisional processes are very sluggish. It takes a long time to happen. But that's not true in the H plus layer. In the H plus layer, you think about electrons, which are moving fast, and you're thinking, and they're very light particles and uh, high speed. So yeah, so the H plus layer is very different from the PDR from the H2 layer. Thank you. So do we find a difference in branch room temperature in optically thin and optically thick cases? Okay, I'll forget that. So the, you go back to something called Kirchhoff's laws in uh, spectroscopy. So Kirchhoff, um, he had a, if you read the Rick Wikipedia life on his art, uh, article on his life, we always think of Kirchhoff's laws as being these, these dumb laws of electricity that we learned in high school. He also did three laws of spectroscopy. And so that uh, the first law is that an optically thick warm object emits a Planck function. Planck was actually Kirchhoff's student. Uh, so Kirchhoff did his work 1850, 1860, something like that. And uh, the uh, Brem Strahlen, okay, uh, that would be Kirchhoff's second law, is that optically thin gas will make emission lines and will make uh, things like the Brem's emission. It's, it's going to be optically thin. And then Kirchhoff's third law is if you put a cool gas in front of a hot opaque object, you get absorption lines. And so there's Kirchhoff's three laws of spectroscopy. So the Brem's emission is what comes from an optically thin gas, if you follow the assumptions. If a layer of optically thin gas becomes optically thick, then you go over to the Planck limit. So it goes, it does, it's no longer making Brem's emission. That may be, that's not what you see. You would see what looks like a Planck function. So it become a, a, an opaque layer that's emitting uh, according to the Planck function. Uh, the, fun, you, the fundamental emission process may still be BREMS, but you don't see that characteristic BREMS spectrum. You see a black body. Okay. Um, so there is a question about uh, the tricolor map of the Orion Nebula. So why the nebula looks like a cavity? Isn't it a dust sphere? And shouldn't we expect to see the, the outer dust uh, that attenuates the visible light. Yeah, so when you look at the, uh, it goes back to the work Manuel Pembert did a very long time ago. 
to find my picture of Orion. It's here somewhere. Uh, here we go. Okay, so this is the Orion Nebula. You can Google up uh, your own image. So what are you looking at here is, uh, this is the actual H2 region down here. So if you point your telescope here, the visible light, you would see, uh, you would see very strong emission lines. If you look out here, and if you look at uh, the spectrum of this light, I think it's Manuel Pembert who first did this, uh, what you see is this is all reflected starlight. This is actually a reflection of the light emitted down here. Uh, more than you wanted to know about the Orion Nebula, if you really work on this hard, this inner region is called the Huygens region, because it was Huygens who first saw the Orion Nebula. Galileo did not make note of the Orion Nebula, so Huygens uh, Huygens thought that the Orion Nebula had appeared between the time of Galileo and Huygens. So Huygens thought that it had appeared just in his lifetime. Um, we think today, or the get, no one knows what happened with Galileo, but we think that Galileo you know, was trying to sell telescopes that you look at something fuzzy on the sky, you, get, you buy a telescope from Galileo, use his telescope, and the fuzzy thing became sharp. And the problem with the Orion Nebula, you buy one of these telescopes and look here, the fuzzy thing is still fuzzy. So maybe he didn't want to point, uh, draw attention to it. But for whatever reason, uh, Galileo didn't make note of it. Huygens discovered it. So that's the real ionized layer. When you get farther out here, more and more of what you're seeing in this fan is uh, just reflection from the inner regions. So it's a very powerful reflection spectrum out here. Uh, while we're at it, someone asked about the x-rays. So the, what's happening here, so here's the bubble. So here, the, the H2 region, OMC1 is encroaching across here. And what's happening is this hot gas, the geometry, the reconstruction, the hot bubble here is blowing out in this direction towards the lower right. Uh, so the, the, uh, the actual x-ray emission is actually discovered down here. There's too much junk in the way that blocks the x-rays from up here. They should be farther here. But uh, there's, so there's a lot of dust, a lot of dust in the environment. You see the scattered light from the dust out here. Uh, if you get down to the core of the Orion Nebula, that's where you see the strong emission lines like this. This is a spectrum of the Huygens region. The outer or the extended Orion Nebula is just a reflection spectrum. So that answered the question. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, very interesting. So another question about really the temperature and density. So are temperature and density degenerated in H2 regions as in PDRs? And if so, would the thermal pressure T times N say something about the temperature inhomogeneities in H2 region? Well, what happens if you go to the, the uh, if you go to the very simple cartoon, you know, hopelessly, hopelessly uh, simple. So here you have molecular gas at 100 Kelvin. And so, so it has a, you know, what happens if you move from here to the PDR, the temperature goes up by factor of 10 and the density goes up by a factor of two because you dissociate the, the hydrogen. It goes from H2 to H. So the pressure here is 20 times higher than the pressure here. And then if you go into the H plus layer, you get another factor of 20 increase because the temperature goes from 1,000 to 10,000 Kelvin. And then the, the you, instead of having two hydrogen atoms, you have two protons, two electrons. 
So the gas pressure jumps by a factor of 400 between the, this H2 region and this H2 region. And so what that does then is it drives a, a flow away from the uh, molecular gas, which you can see here. This is the M16 pillars of creation. So this is this is from the same geometry. We're looking at it edge on here, but here we're looking at it face on. So you do have a so it's the change in pressure are driving this this flow that you can you can see on the space telescope image, and you can it's actually seen in Orion too, but only in changes in radial velocity. We don't have we don't have this view of it. Um, so. What does that do? So this is a very clearly, this is a, a hydrodynamical situation. And uh, there's a simple limiting case called a, decrit a decritical ionization front, which is the, the time steady solution where the starlight uh, is eating its way into the molecular cloud. <laughs> and we've done papers on, on predicting the uh, the emission from a decritical ionization front. But <clears throat> it's not that different from a static uh, H2 region, and uh, that's what people tend to do. So that's where the pressures are. And then the situation that ends up being generated is that uh, uh, you have a mix of pressures. Now, if you get into what's really happening in nature, you can't ignore the magnetic field. And so the magnetic field is, uh, and, you know, just talking about gas pressure so far, the magnetic pressure is normally not very important in the H plus layer. But because of flux freezing, when you go to denser and denser gases, you go from uh, the low density gas to the very dense gas here, because of flux freezing, when you compressed gas, the magnetic lines, of course, come closer together as the magnetic field gets stronger. The uh, magnetic pressure is proportional to the magnetic field strength squared. So is the, if, you, if you double the density of the gas by squeezing it together, you double the magnetic field, the magnetic pressure goes up by four times. And so what ends up actually happening in nature is that these um, atomic uh, and molecular layers are normally magnetically supported, not by gas pressure. So you really cannot look back the magnetic field. In, in the it's a tragedy because magnetic fields are really complicated. It's hard to measure them. As, you, know, you can measure the geometry with linear polarization, but you can't really get the magnetic field strength accurately there. You need circular polarization to do that. And that's a very hard observation to do. But uh, so, so, okay, so two answers here. One quick one is that in the simple case where you think about NKT, the gas pressure is changing in a consistent way and it's getting, the density is getting higher and higher. What happens in nature is as, it, as the density changes, the magnetic field gets more important and it eventually becomes magnetically supported. So we've done papers in which we argue that the final geometry is in, is in magnetostatic equilibrium. It's a combination. The geometry's final configuration is the pressure due to the hot bubble, which forms the base. Then there's pressure added from the attenuation of the starlight. The starlight has momentum this absorbs in this layer that pushes the layer back against the molecular cloud that compresses the gas and you end up with uh, uh, a strong molecular, uh, a strong molecular, uh, magnetic field and lots of magnetic pressure. So finally, so the pressure terms are the hot gas thermal pressure here, the outward pressure due to the starlight being absorbed, and then finally magnetic pressure here. And then that's the you know, turbulent pressure comes in as well. Turbulent pressure is, you know, in the simplest case, you would think of turbulent magnetic pressures being equal, but it doesn't hold in the Orion environment. There are some places where one is much bigger than the other, but uh, they're all, all these pressures are coming in, especially when you get into the 
the, the molecular or the PR regions. Okay, thank you very much, Gary.